Jack's quicker than you anyway, so you're out of luck. Good evening, everyone. I think we're going to try and get started. So this is obviously a round roundtable meeting. Uh, I have uh, Jim Lehan and uh, Scott Bugby from the Board of Selectmen up with me. Uh, Sue Jacobson is uh, taking some minutes for us, and also uh, she represents the f uh, administrative assistant for the Affordable Housing Committee. Um, so I thank you all for coming. I know we have a lot of board members here and some uh, probably some neighbors of the Lawrence Street area, and I appreciate you all coming tonight. But we're here for uh, Mr. DePlacido and his uh, partners uh, to talk about the property, Buckley and Man, and some of the other properties <coughs> down in that area. Um, I thought we would spend, obviously, most of the time with Mr. DePlacido talking about uh, he's got a couple of different op options that he wants to just start talking about with the town. Um, I think there's a lot of uh, this is a great opportunity for us to really kind of partner with the developer. To uh, It's a major development uh, to talk about the benefits for him as well as for the town, and I, I appreciate him coming forward to have this discussion with us. Uh, we also want to talk, Mr. McGee, from the director of the DPW, um, somewhat related to this, but, uh, but, but not necessarily. We want to talk about water supply after Mr. DePlacido speaks, um, just because we need, you know, you know, as all the board members, particularly the planning board and some of the other permitting boards, we want to talk about water supply going forward. Uh, Bob has some reports that uh, one of our consultants has put together. And we just want to make sure that uh, going forward, we're all on the same page about that infrastructure uh, and what we need to meet our future build out. So, uh, unless one of the selectmen would like to say something, we'll turn it right over to Mr. DePlacido. Yeah, turn the mic on. I'll make sure it's green on the bottom. Otherwise, it's just for at home, not that everyone can hear you or anything. But I oh, I should tell you, uh, obviously, that we're on we're video and, and audio tape tonight. Do you have one? Is it orange like Christine? Do you have one? Okay, it's fine. It's just, it's, okay. I'm not sure why it's orange. I thought, I thought it was green, but there you go. Just hold it close. I need to find you a new job. For the record, uh, my name is Thomas DePlacido, Jr. I really want to thank everybody for coming out tonight. It's not the warmest night out there that we've uh, experienced here at the end of February, so I do appreciate everyone coming out in the, uh, the cold weather here. And just I'd like to introduce a couple of people here. Um, to my left, is actually a planning consultant, uh, Angus Jennings. Uh, over here in the front row, we have uh, my engineer, uh, Rick Goudreau, uh, Council Tom Manicelli. And then in the back row, we have uh, Council John Smolak and actually uh, uh, Matthew and Ariel de Placido, which actually represent uh, fourth generation of uh, family businesses and construction and things that, uh, that are getting into the business. And um, sort of what the purpose of tonight's meeting is, is that I wanted to back up a little bit and, and actually work on an effort to really plan a project, especially something of this magnitude. Instead of just coming out and laying out a subdivision or something and, and putting it on the town's lap uh, for approval, disapproval, and discussion, I wanted to open up the discussion and uh, get some direction from, from all you folks here. All right, I've heard a lot of uh, talk and a lot of different things the town may need, the town may, you know, um, require or different um, ways the town would like to grow. And you know what? I'd like to get those all out before us here tonight, um, you know, and, and move in a direction. So really the purpose of tonight's meeting is, when we're done here, is to maybe have a straw vote of, of which way that we lean towards what type of development and then actually maybe grow into some type of uh, working session so that we could actually... Um, then evolve into how we develop the property. Um, <clears throat> so tonight here, for those of you who aren't familiar, we're going to be talking about the Buckley and Mann property and also uh, SM LaRusso property, which is adjacent to it. Okay? For those of you not familiar where the site is, it, it may not be the, the easiest thing to read here. It is hatched. This is the site here. Represents about 220 acres, both combined parcels. Park Street, one of the major streets that connect Rentham and Norfolk, is right here. And actually, Lawrence Street is right there. So this property uh, encompasses uh, Bush Pond there. Um, a lot of people fish, use that as a resource area for activities. And it actually goes all the way to the town of Franklin and uh, Norfolk town line. And it's pretty much almost runs behind Park Street, almost to the railroad line. 
to the commuter rail. So it's a vast piece of property. It offers a lot of opportunities. Um, in fact, the more familiar that I became with the property, the more opportunities um, that I saw that it presented. That's what lead me to the, led me to this discussion here. And in fact, I thought, you know, moving forward with looking at this site, we really need to align our interest and, and come to some type of common goal and on how to approach a development on this. Okay? Looking at this, the site here, and when I decided not to develop it as a traditional subdivision, I wanted to put something up here to presentation tonight. As I said, there's opportunities here, and I wanted to break this large site into actually three opportunity zones because each one offers a different opportunity for the town. And how we develop it, <coughs> really will impact the town for many, many years to come. We're looking at the site here, this is a blow up. <coughs> this is actually the Buckley and Mann property and the SM LaRusso property. Once again, it's about 220 acres. This is Lawrence Street that runs down through here. I tried to make this big enough. This is actually a four foot by three foot plan so that it's, um, you know, hopefully everybody can see it. And we have opportunity zone A in this area here. <coughs> the shade of green. It actually encompasses the pond that's right here and, an, and a river that runs through. It's actually behind Bush Pond Road and it's actually parallel to Park Street. It runs all the way down through here. That's about 73 and a half acres, 73.54 acres to be exact. Looking at the potential opportunities there, we most definitely can put some type of road through here, develop it as residential. Um, right now it's virgin land. It could be set aside as open space. And, and I have to tell everybody in this room, if, if anybody's ever walked this site, the topography is up and down, and, and it's, it actually is a stunning site. If you're up over in this area in the fall, if you look across, this is a hill that comes up. I mean, it, with the foliage and everything, it reflects off the pond here and stuff. It's just, it's a gorgeous site for actually some type of open space preservation with that. Um, another potential use is maybe some active recreation. Maybe a small portion of this area gets set aside maybe for some type of athletic field or something for, uh, you know, people to enjoy to, to watch uh, a game or, you know, uh, for soccer or football or baseball. Or maybe there's even some trails that are put through here for some type of passive recreation. <coughs> Zone A offers a, a lot of opportunities there. Same thing, looking for direction in the town, how we may want to utilize this Zone A. Zone B, as you're going down Lawrence Street here, this area is mostly the area that's sort of disturbed right now. It has the old foundations on it. Um, you know, there's a lot of vacant land. It's not the most attractive site. That really is, a, is you know, can be used for residential development, open space, or active uh, types of recreation again. But where the land's already been previously disturbed, it makes the most sense to try to, you know, focus more on maybe residential development in that area. You know, although we could use it for um, open space or, or any types of active recreation, you know, it makes the most sense to maybe put, you know, some type of residential development up in this area. That represents about 74.71 acres. The last opportunity zone <coughs> is zone C, which is 58.49 acres, okay? That's to the rear of the property. It, um, it's wooded. There's a lot of wetlands back there. It's a very nice open space area. Um, you could do some potential residential development, but it's not the most conducive space for, or, or area for any type of residential development. Um, what it does have is... Um, been told, and, and, and you know, I know the town has been out there, it's a potential water resource area. So maybe the opportunity here is, is that land is set aside as some type of water resource area in the future. So we have different opportunity zones here, and they could be mixed and mingled. We could put residential in different ones. We could set aside open space. We can, you know, active recreation, whether it's, you know, ball fields or even other uses that I, that I haven't mentioned or I may not even be aware of here. And how we, you know, come to some type of ultimate development with that, I'm asking everyone here and there and, you know, for some input with things as we move forward. So 
keeping this in mind, the different opportunity zones here, I wanted to show you what a traditional conventional subdivision would look like if we were to develop this under your current zoning. This is a concept conventional subdivision. It pretty much conforms to all your regulations that are there now. If you look at this, this is the same 220 acres. Almost all of it's used up for house lots. The zoning in this area of town, you're looking at uh, it's 55,000 square feet. Eats up large chunks of land. Needs a lot of roadway to support it. Um, you look through here. We're coming out with a roadway through here. That nice vista and everything I told you about, that's gone. It's going to be a roadway in there. It's going to be house lots. Come across. We do have a wetland crossing. Okay. Um, it actually, we looked at it. It's the most narrowest part of the, of, uh, of the river there. Um, it looks like it's very possible that we can, we can do that. And you come down here and open this up. And as you can see, really that's all that's left aside. I mean, all the uplands is, is being used. So we have a lot of roadway here, a lot of maintenance for the town in the future. We've lost opportunity zones B and most of C because we've had to crowd back with, with the residential development. Um, out of that 220 acres, we don't have a lot of open space left. We've lost our opportunities. Now, we can look at this from a lot of different angles with everything. You know, this is one concept according to, you know, the, the uh, uh, conceptual uh, conventional subdivision plan. You know, we can go to the opposite end of the spectrum, and we could aggressively go after this with, with some type of 40B or whatever. Everybody in this room, I'm sure, knows how to do the mathematics with 220 acres under a 40B design and what it could, you know, the ending result is. I, I, you know, I've, I've never been one to, act, to go and develop something to full density like that. I just don't think that's the right thing to do. I always like to try to set aside open space. Um, big advocate of, of, of recreation and different things that we can try to incorporate into a project when we develop it. So it's probably something in between that. Okay, from a conventional to some type of, you know, compact neighborhood or incentive-based zoning that would probably be the most attractive, the most beneficial, and offer the most opportunities for the town. And as we align our interests together, actually come to some type of common goal here for development. With that, I just want to show some type of concept plan of what some type of compact neighborhood may look like. If we were to cluster houses just in the zone B area here, okay, we could set aside all of zone A and zone C, actually two out of the three opportunity zones in this area here. We could work with the town if there's some type of um, incentive-based zoning or something like that that we could actually implement in this site. And the purpose is maybe some type of working group or anything. If we look at this and we look at what <coughs> approximately 60 to, 75, 60 to 70 house lots under a conventional design plan would, would, would do, with the road cost, the infrastructure, and the development of those larger lots, I'm going to be forced to do four bedroom, five bedroom houses, more children in the school systems, bigger houses. Maybe that's the way the town would like to go. Something like this. I can reduce lot sizes, reduce road cost, which is a savings for the town in the future. I can actually integrate three bedroom houses, smaller houses, even ranches, two bedroom ranches. All these types of homes attract different types of buyers, buyers that don't impact the community in, in all one way if we have all four bedroom or five bedroom houses. So there's a lot of different things we can do with this. By also developing it in um, a more cluster or, or a denser approach here with some type of incentive-based zoning or something. Um, let me switch hands here for a second. That's more than 60 or 70 units. Mm -hmm. That's more than 60 or 70 units. <coughs> if I can reduce my overall cost per unit, whether it be by more units or, um, you know, roads and saying less roads or less frontage to actually develop a house lot, mm -hmm. There are some incentives that I can work with the town in, too. Potentially, 
if this does end up back in this area to be some type of water resource that the town can use, obviously I need to put some type of water main through here. You know, depending on how everything is developed and, and what we end up with units, an 8 inch main or a 12 inch main or something would be what you normally put in type of subdivision road to, for water. It wouldn't take much the cost of the pipe to maybe upgrade that to a 12 inch or 16 inch main while I'm constructing roads in here that acts as, as that ultimate conduit to maybe bring water from a well into the community. You're talking savings of hundreds of thousands of dollars if not more by working together. Is it viable? I know there's some infrastructure improvements that need to be done in this area. Potentially a bridge and things like that. Um, once again, working together we can accomplish some of these types of things. We could set aside this land as open space or potentially some type of recreation field. Once again, working together with things, I may be able to contribute to some of the development on those types of um, fields of recreation. So there's a lot of opportunities here. Opportunities that, you know what, the people that I mentioned here tonight, our team with things, if we can work with, you know, our, you know community leaders, um, I think we could come up to something that's really special here for the community. That's sort of my overview of what we're looking at, opportunity zones, where we could go, what things we would need to discuss with it, with everything. I've talked about what I could potentially do with development, um, you know, what potentially I could offer with things and working together with the community. There's another sort of segment to this, and what I'd like to do is introduce um, planning consultant Angus Jennings here that can talk about other opportunities that are out there for incentives um, that could be available to the community here to help in the development of the site and actually offer um, some funding mechanisms too. With that, I'd like to turn it over to Angus. Thanks very much, Tom, and I appreciate the opportunity to be here. And uh, I'm going to uh, start just to uh, introduce myself, say a bit about uh, why Tom had reached out to me and, um, and what role uh, I would have uh, as this goes forward. So uh, my, I'm uh, Angus Jennings. I uh, am a uh, planner, uh, planner by training. I've spent about 14 years in the field here in Massachusetts. Uh, seven years of those I have been working for towns as staff as the town planner in Marshfield for four years and then more recently as the director of land use management in Westford. Uh, from 2010 to early last year where I oversaw planning, zoning, conservation, and building. So uh, the, the, the other ha half of my uh, career has been in consulting. Uh, I've done a lot of work around the Commonwealth uh, for cities and towns or for private sector uh, proponents. Uh, a lot of that work has involved zoning, uh, design standards, design guidelines, as well as infrastructure finance. Uh, so I had uh, first met Tom, I must have been six or seven years ago, I was doing some work in the town of Rentham, and uh, I've also worked with uh, John Smolak, uh, one of uh, John's council, uh, on a, a 40R initiative that was very successful. So, I've, uh, so Tom had reached out to me, he told me a bit about uh, the situation here and asked uh, whether I'd be uh, able to be helpful, and I was, um, I was very impressed right out of the gate with the approach that he's taken with this meeting tonight. Uh, in my time as uh, both as town, town planner type or in my conversations with private sector developers, my recommendation to them is to start the process with something like this. Instead of very often, uh, as I'm sure you know, uh, too often before the town knows what's being considered, you've got fully engineered plans on the table. And at that point, the die are cast, uh, it's going in a certain direction, and while there may be some opportunity for the municipality to uh, adjust things here and there, uh, there's a, a, a lot of sunk costs that on the private side and therefore uh, there's some inertia in terms of trying to look at what could really happen. So what he's done here, which is introduced a couple of concepts, uh, some, some potentially <coughs> big ideas and some potentially big public benefits, uh, I think is uh, really an exemplary way to start the process. So I was very, very pleased to be uh, part of that and pleased to be here tonight. So, um, the, uh, uh, yeah, so the, the typical development dynamics in my experience uh, too often by the, you know, the first meeting is one where kind of the 
the lines are drawn, so to speak. So uh, I think this is a, a real opportunity. Um, as Tom talked about, the, the real goal, and I, as once I finish, I will spend a lot of the, the evening hearing from you all and getting into a discussion about what you know, pros and cons, ideas, questions, concerns that you may have, and try to get as much of that on the table as we can, because the more information that Tom and his team have, uh, the more effective they can be in helping to move forward and ideally in a uh, process-based uh, approach, which he outlined with, uh, with a working group where uh, key people in the community, whether that's representing boards and commissions or uh, members of the neighborhoods, but to actually be w around the table working on how some of this comes together. Uh, and in my experience, that can be a very high-value approach that results in uh, really a win-win win outcome, ideally where the private sector, the, uh, the town as a, as a town and the neighborhoods are all uh, seeing their interests advanced uh, as it goes forward. So one thing that was of interest to me is, uh, I don't know how many people in this room were uh, directly involved with the 495 Compact, uh, but, but hopefully that's something that you're uh, aware of. That was a 37 town planning initiative that happened in uh, 2011 to 2012, and as part of that, uh, and that included Nor Norfolk. And uh, this site was actually identified in that plan specifically as priority uh, development slash preservation. And when I was in Westford working on uh, that designation, what it basically means uh, is, at, uh, and I would uh, uh, be interested in hearing from people um, who may have been part of that here in town, uh, but it basically indicates there's uh, there's natural value to the land, and there's an interest to see <coughs> development as development goes forward to see that incorporate a significant uh, land protection component. And I think that's what's uh, that's what's uh, potential here. So, a couple of uh, potential approaches we've talked about, and we haven't gone too far down the road on any of these because we wanted to uh, get a sense of where we are coming out of tonight, and and then make decisions about where to invest time and energy, but. Tom had mentioned uh, incentive-based zoning. Uh, there's a, a couple of uh, options on the table there that have uh, come out in the last several years. One people may be aware of, I think you are, is the, the 40R Smirko zoning, and I understand that's been uh, considered here and was not enacted. Uh, whether this site would qualify or not is an open question. Uh, that's something that if coming out of tonight, if that's something we want to uh, explore that specifically, uh, that, that can certainly happen, and one thing that the the uh, Commonwealth is willing to do now that they didn't do five years ago is they will actually give a non-binding opinion on the eligibility of a site before you go all the way down the road of filing an application. Uh, so that's something that could be explored. Tom also mentioned the Compact Neighborhoods uh, Initiative, which is something that's a much newer program, so there's not... Uh, you can hit the, oh, you might have hit the button oh, accidentally. Okay. So uh, the Compact Neighborhoods Program, uh, which is a newer initiative, so there aren't the same kind of examples that you can point to around the Commonwealth of what's been constructed as there are with 40R. Uh, but Compact Neighborhoods is something that at first glance looks like it could be a good fit for a site like this, and that has some additional benefits, uh, specifically that uh, the Commonwealth could then uh, be a partner and bring more resources to the table on infrastructure. Uh, the infrastructure support is an important piece of this because in addition to potential for uh, direct investment through the Commonwealth, through Mass Works or um, other programs, there's other non-state programs, like uh, believe it or not, the USDA has a uh, infrastructure support program uh, that could come into play, uh, which, and, and basically the effect that that can have on a project like this, the developer goes into it knowing he's, he's got to make investments, making sure the roads, and the water and sewer, that that's all going to work. But when you can bring other sources of funding into it, that can allow for not only those baseline mitigation uh, investments, but, um, but additional public benefits and amenities that can come out uh, of, of that investment. Um, the, you know, it seems to me uh, initially the, uh, you know, the, the clear potential upside for the town here is the water supply and then the potential preservation of significant open land, what, whether that ends up being for, uh, whether the best benefit there ends up being leaving it in its natural uh, 
uh, state as passive recreation or more of an active recreation. That's something where our ears are open, and that's exactly why we're here, is to get a sense of um, you know, where the, the team should be putting its time. Uh, part of the basic dynamic in a situation like this is really one of alternate futures. Uh, this can go a couple of ways, and uh, I think uh, you know, Tom's been uh, really clear that you know, w I think we, the whole team, thinks there's a real win-win outcome. So, uh, so that's basically the intent of tonight's meeting is to start that conversation. And uh, because I have done a lot of uh, consulting work on, you know, almost you name the program, uh, you know, if there are questions that people have specifically about how something may or may not work, I'm happy to get into that uh, as we get into the discussion. And then obviously we will f uh, follow up with, uh, with more detail based on what direction seems to, we seem to be going coming out of tonight. So. Uh, so with that, I'm uh, happy to be here. I'll, I'll turn it back to Tom to open the uh, discussion. I'd like to thank everybody for their patience and, and listening to our little um, presentation here with things. Um, what I'd like to do is just open it up. I'm, I'm sure there's some potential questions here. Well, I mean, we just sort of painted a broad stroke of different things that could potentially happen. Um, you know, I, I, it's tough to answer specifics, but I'd be happy to answer any questions or, or defer questions to uh, Mr. Jennings if, if the audience or, or any of the board members here have any, any questions. Certainly. Go ahead. Uh, hi, Tom. Thanks. Thanks for doing this, by the way. Um, we appreciate it. A, a couple of questions on 40R. We, we've explored that in the past, and um, 40R is very specific density considerations. Mm -hmm. And it also has a, a direct tie to public transportation, walking distance to schools, town center, and things of that nature. Do you really feel that this, w I mean, I know the benefit to the town and, and that the payments associated with permitting and mm -hmm. getting occupancy and things of that nature, but do you see that this would even have an opportunity to qualify for a 40R? That's, I mean, that's exactly the right question on, on the policy, and the answer is, um, and we're in a live televised meeting, I don't know if... Uh, any staff are watching, but I think it's a unlikely. It's not. <laughs> it's not a non-starter. Uh, it is uh, potentially uphill. It's certainly not what's going to fall into the wheelhouse of the, uh, you know, the smart growth location. But let me tell you why I say that. So under the <coughs> statute and the regs, as you may know, there are three different ways that a site can be eligible. Category one, which is proximity to transit, and summarized, but. Category two is uh, area of concentrated development, and uh, this isn't going to meet those criteria, even though it's previously developed. That, that ties in with uh, existing zoning and, and access to uh, water and sewer infrastructure. The third way that a site can qualify as being highly suitable, or as, as being eligible, is to be a so-called highly suitable location. And um, where this site was identified in the 495 compact that at least tells me and and i'd be curious to hear how involved the town was because i don't know who made that designation i just know it shows up on the map uh, but but someone thought that the site was suitable for development what the way the regulations read in 40r is uh, under the highly suitable is the department of housing community development shall presume that a site is eligible if it is identified in a locally adopted uh, housing or master plan. Uh, so a, a great example is uh, I worked with the town of Linfield on the uh, 40R approved there. That's the what's now known the Market Street project. And it was a uh, golf course. Uh, it was uh, under control by a developer. And in working between the developer and the town, they decided 40R was going to be the right approach in that case. and. Um, they amended their local housing production plan to identify that site as being one that would be suitable to get some higher densities and some mixed income uh, housing. Because of the way the regulations are written, uh, there's difference in there to local plans. So I've reviewed that affordable housing plan that's it's a few years older, but it's, uh, you know, it doesn't have the mapping. As you may know, in 2008, the regulations were changed, and so now a housing production plan has to have uh, maps with specific sites identified. Um, and if that were to happen, uh, that's something that, uh, and again, there's no 
guarantees, but, but the department could have deference to that if, through the course of updating the plan, the town of Norfolk uh, comes to the conclusion that this is, in fact, a site that you'd want to prioritize. So, uh, so there's some process there, and that's uh, now the uh, – and, and Lin in Linfield, I should say, I said it was a golf course. It is right on 128, but, but access to um, vehicular transportation does not rate for anything in 40R. Uh, so what made it work there was really the designation in the local plan. It was not served by water and sewer. Uh, so that's the most analogous <coughs> site I can think of. The other point that you raised that's very important to understand is the densities and the minimum densities. Um, if you just do the math, and uh, so we're talking, you know, ballpark 75 acres, call it for, the, uh, for that one portion of the site, even at the lowest allowable density of eight units per acre, that's a that's a build out number that is significantly higher than anything Tom's thinking about. So so how can that work? Um, how it can work specifically in this case is really a matter of the, the engineer kind of drawing the boundaries in such a way. But let me give you an example. Uh, in Kingston, they did a 40R. Uh, the eligibility was never in question. It was right. It was a gravel pit next to the train station. But in calculating the allowable unit count, uh, the site in that case was 107 acres. The total allowed development under that bylaw was 730 units, which is a, a, a big build out for a town of like Kingston of 11,000 people. Um, but even at eight units per acre times 107 acres, you're still above 730. And the mix in that, that case, uh, unlike what's shown here, showed a combination of single-family townhouse and multifamily. So some of that was zoned for the 12 and the 20 unit densities that 40R requires. So how did that all work? <coughs> the way it worked is DHD, the state housing agency, was actually very good to work with. And I haven't said that always over my career. You know, some programs, they're very difficult. They've actually been very good, I think, in how they've administered 40R because they, once you get at the table, they're trying to help make it work too. Uh, so what happened in that case was the overall development concept uh, showed a uh, major boulevard and there was a, a central retention pond and there was basically all of this land that was going to be part of future right of way. Uh, and even though the regulations don't specifically allow this, uh, the, the department took the position they don't disallow it, and what they allowed the town of Kingston to do was to take those that future right-of-way and exclude that from the calculation of developable land. It was a creative approach. It was, uh, uh, you know, this was in 2007, so, um, it, you know, there's different people now. And so all of these things, I can't sit here today and say that would definitely work, but I can say that that these kinds of approaches, and, and I've seen it many times where people will read the statute, read the reg, say, you know, that's not going to work here. But when you look at the actual case studies, there's a lot more creative applications of 40R um, than, than a lot of people know about. So again, I don't know that that would work, but it's, it's not a non-starter. Um, okay. Just one quick follow-up question. Sure. Yeah. Tom, I, I, hard for me to count that. How many units is that? Um, to tell you the truth, I, I had Rick just spot brown houses <laughs> on there. There's no lot lines or anything, just to give an overall concept with things. And this is not reflective of, of what I'm, you know, yeah. looking okay. to do, but just as an illustration, I can tell you there's over 150. I don't know exactly okay. what the number is. But that would be the range that you're looking for in a clustered kind of situation like that. Well, it's, it's, a, it's a balancing type of thing. I mean, you know, the more affordable that I can bring in, you know, per unit cost and things and everything, the more I can actually, yep. you know, work with the town in other ways. Um, so, the, so the fewer or the, or the higher cost per unit, um, the less I have to, to work with, with the town with that. Right. So that's where I'm looking for, you know, some type of feedback from everybody here working together. It's one last question, and I'll be quiet for a while. Um, where is the um, polluted part of that property? <clears throat> right now, the site is, 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 let me address that, actually, is uh, back in about 2000, 2001, actually, Camp Dresser McKee went into the site, and um, the buildings were removed, raised, 
and actually there was um, some equipment and some other uh, debris that was inside the buildings and things that was actually buried on site with an activity and use limitation. What that means is that um, it, it was covered over, you cannot disturb it. Uh, anyone familiar with any type of uh, uh, work that uh, Camp Dresser McKee does knows that they're, they're a very, very good outfit. Um, the reports, the studies literally fill boxes and boxes of uh, information with that. I actually hired one uh, LSP, a licensed site professional, to go review some of these things, go into it, and um, oh, actually you grab the mic. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It's just for, again, people yep. at home. Yep. Just to back up, um, Camp Dresser and McKee did the, uh, did the cleanup to the site and actually prepared what they call an uh, AUL, an activity use limitation area, where um, some of the debris that was, that was in the buildings there was, was actually covered over. And it, it's really like a meadow. If you went out there, you, would, you wouldn't even know where it is right now. And activity use limitation, exactly what it, what it, what it means. Um, you can't do anything on it. Um, you can actually do active recreation, right? In the permits, you could put a ball field or anything like that, <coughs> but you can't build a house on it or put a road through it or disturb it. Um, I did hire one licensed site professional to go review all the data. We actually went out and did test holes underneath all the foundations last summer and uh, fall there. All the info, just to see what was exactly happening in the ground. All of our test results came back good. Uh, once again, reflected the fact that uh, Camp Dresser McKee did a, did a very good job in the cleanup. I always like to uh, err on the side of caution and double check. I hired another licensed site professional just to check his work <laughs> and go through. And um, same feedback again. Um, everything looked very good. We're going to follow that up when the weather breaks to actually do some additional test holes beyond where the buildings once were, um, into the woods and things to, to check things out. And also, um, I believe it's not part of the DEP conditions and things, but I believe the local conservation commission had some monitoring wells out there that were in the process. We want to locate those, find those, and test some of those areas as well. But everything that we've seen, the site is, is, is very clean. Okay. Thank you. And just so you know, if looking at this, that area would approximately be probably in here. Yeah, sort of thought. Okay. Yeah. <coughs> Uh, just before you speak, just tell us who you are, John. Uh, John Weddleton, Conservation. Hi, Tommy. How are you? Could you put up the other plan that shows the conventional subdivision? <coughs> now, currently the status of this, this subdivision uh, through conservation... <coughs> I think there's five outstanding orders of condition. Uh, three were abandoned. I think a couple were expired. And the last developer that tried to put in 23 lots in here after a few years, as you probably know, had walked away. Anytime you have a plan like this, and you probably realize this too, but I know you don't want to spend much money initially. Uh, we have a site like this at the airport. The resource areas, the wetlands in here are extensive. So when you look at that plan and you look at the roadway coming up the right-hand side, that probably is not going to be a road that's going to happen. So that being said, you take that away and you take all those lots away, it, it changes the scope. So what I would like to see, the same thing I told the airport potential developer that ended up walking away, you should have the plan, and we went through this at the conservation with all the resources identified, the resource area, they should be listed on the plan, and the conventional subdivision layout should be done, and we should all see exactly how much of this infrastructure and the lots are actually controlled by conservation in there. Then I think we have a, a much better you know, measuring stick between the two plans. Secondly, I think you're aware of, and I would like to see that hazardous waste on there, I think it's on the left-hand side of the river. Right in this area, right yeah. and everything in, everything in that in that blue has a 200 foot barrier on either side that can't be touched by the rivers act. So, all of these resource lines on this plan really would make a big difference, along with the uh, the hazardous waste. And uh, 
the last reports we had on that, uh, you, your licensed professionals probably told you, I don't think the state annual filings that are supposed to be done have been done in probably 10 or 20 years. So that's never been updated. So really the status of that I think is still pretty uncertain as far as the state goes. But to, to look at that plan, if you were to put the resource series on there that we just delineated in our, in our meeting with you, I think that would give us a better idea of what you're doing there, uh, how much of those lots are in the, the buffer zone, how much are in the outside buffer zone, and how much are clear. Because the focusing down there is good. It looks like the other plan, the, the condensed plan with the 150 houses, I believe that's probably mostly outside all of the conservation area land. Is that correct? Let me, let me just defer a couple of your, of your questions, John, yeah. to, to the, uh, Rick, the engineer. I, I do believe that everything in the other plan is outside 100-foot uh, resource area and the 200-foot riparian. Right. I believe also this side is outside 100-foot and 200-foot riparian in here, correct? Correct. Do you know what this is? Is this outside the 50, this roadway here? No. Okay. On that. So I don't know. You, you, yeah. you don't know the exact distances or anything like that? I don't. Okay. Now, either way, you, you should have a plan showing the resource areas on there because if you're going to decide on, you know, what's doable or not, you can't be doable if you're in, you know, with 50 feet of a buffer zone. So that would be a good start along with the hazardous waste. And in this project, just a question, is the water line still required to be run from Park Street to Franklin? I, I have no idea on that. I Maybe we can ask the DP. At the last project, one of the requirements to get water was to have the line that ran from uh, Park Street to, to Franklin, which I think was one of the big deterrents for Scott Caldwell finally walking away. But maybe I can let Bob speak to that. Hi, Bob McGee, Director of Public Works. I think that's a, um, I didn't know the history as well as, I don't know the history as well as John does, but one of the questions I probably would have asked when it came around to, to me was to ask you what, what your water supply intention was. We have a, uh, we have water comes down Park Street and stops um, short of Maple, and, uh, or maybe right at Maple. So there is probably a potential for a connection out there. But lend the cat out of the bag a little bit early, we have a, a water uh, supply assessment report which probably says that uh, we couldn't supply that subdivision with the way it's proposed right now with our current water supply. So this gets into some <coughs> of the things that we had talked about earlier, Tom, where if we couldn't supply you with water, what was your intention for water supply to these homes? Um, <coughs> I guess we'd have to put wells in on that if we had to do that. I didn't know if that's permissible. The last developer, the problem was Cranberry Heights, which is a 22 lot subdivision. Just so you know, Cranberry Heights is a 23 lot subdivision on the other side of Lawrence Street that was approved years ago. And one of the uh, uh, reasons that was walked away by a, a developer, I think, in Wellesley was because of the water line cost. And he was teaming up with Scott Caldwell, who was developing this side, because the water line, I think, was well over a mile long going from uh, Park Street to Franklin. And in new construction, you're not allowed to have wells in new residential construction subdivisions. Is that a local bylaw? That's the law. I didn't know that. Did you know that? Zoning regulation, yeah. Zoning regulation, yeah. I mean, Bob Ball can address it, but. Just one thing I'd, I'd like to say is that, uh, uh, Tom, I didn't mean to put you on the spot with uh, coming at you with a question like that because I, I actually know the answer to the question. That's probably the best way to get it out. We talked. I would like to say in the past, working with Mr. DePlacido, that, um, <coughs> that of all the developers that I've, I've worked with, um, you've been true to your word. And, um, and with that, I'd like to say that there's, you know, I get a handful of questions, or there's a handful of questions that need to be addressed. For instance, the Lawrence Street Bridge. I don't know if this, that bridge probably has a lifespan of maybe just a couple of years. Um, I think it was built in 1909. It's, it's um, if, you know, that's just one thing. 
with this kind of traffic, I'm pretty certain that something would have to be addressed with that that bridge would be uh, probably torn down and, and have to be rebuilt. I really don't know the answer to that. I could also tell you that uh, Lawrence Street right now, we have stretches of Lawrence Street, which is only 18 feet wide. I don't think with this kind of traffic going into a, a subdivision planning uh, 150 families that uh, that road would would be permissible. So there's so many things to talk about water supply. Um, you knew this was coming, um, and I know that you're just doing a conceptual idea, and it's pretty certain that you're looking at a cluster development versus the versus the conventional, if you could even do that. So really, there's a lot to be. Um, there's a lot to either negotiate or consider. I know, for instance, that uh, on that map there, you can see that there's some town property, too. Maybe uh, there is some great things that we could do between the town and you, Tom, when it comes to building that bridge, bringing the water up, upgrading the street, maybe swapping off some land for uh, some of this. But it's above my head to negotiate this thing, and I don't think this is the time to do it. So much to talk about. That what you're hitting upon and what uh, Mr. Weddleton's hitting upon are exactly some of the types of you know concerns and issues that we need to discuss. I mean, this whole meeting here was was not to flush out every single issue or anything like that, but was actually to gear towards is there any is there any type of incentive, any type of uh, movement where people in this room and, and uh, board members would consider some type of you know, compact neighborhood incentive zoning or something else and um, working together on some type of uh, plan that's more cluster based on everything. Um, if that's the case, then you know, we could actually establish maybe some type of working group and flush these ideas out, talk about it, and um, you know, come up with resolutions and, and that are uh, good <coughs> for all our common interest with things. If not, then that's great too. We can make this work with a conventional subdivision, but a lot of different things happen with that. And there's other opportunities out there, too, that uh, we can develop with the site. But I don't think any of them offer the attractiveness and the other opportunities and, and goals that, um, that maybe like a, like a compact neighborhood could. Tom? Um, and Bob, jump in on this. We, we have a significant water issue in town. Um, we, need a, we need a new source, and I think it's... 1.3, 1.4 million dollars, somewhere in that range for a new well. That would be a cost uh, that we estimated for this site, right? Because we did take a peek at this site. Um, and I believe that if I'm, you tell me if I'm wrong, Bob, but I believe we've looked at this land. We have. We That's know from thought. history that it was a potential. We've gone out. We've invested some money. We've done some pre preliminary uh, pumping, but not to the point where we've got to the DEP where we're going to do some extent from longer, extensive pumping. Right now, I, I can tell you that just a little bit of history, Jim, um, and you probably know this, but back in 1995, we made some land purchase, and we have some more land mm -hmm. uh, over by the Mill River area, another part of town, which um, <coughs> early pumping tests, that's probably the greatest source that we could hope to ever use if we can, if we can get that permitted. And permitting is a whole other um, issue. So we have two sites that we're pursuing right now, this being a potential site in the Mill River site being a potential site, but um, you're right. Right now, we could not. I don't think we have a report here. Just to let you know, we have a report here that says if we you just took all our water mains right now, there's a lot of people that aren't even hooked up to it. There's some 800 and something residents. If they decided to hook up to that to our water system right now, given the supply that we currently have and the permitting that the DEP allows us to uh, pump water. We couldn't handle the site right now, or I think it would be, it would put us right to the ceiling, and it would be a consideration uh, to. So I think that this has a chance as great as, a greater chance as we have of getting a new water supply. So a partnership is critical. So um, again, Jack Hathaway. Um, so we know water is a is a is a challenge for us, um, and. Tom touched briefly on, uh, you know, open space and, and either passive or, or active recreation. I'm, kind of, I'm curious if other people have, uh, you know, are, are there other opportunities that the town could take advantage of that, that 
um, any of the groups here, and you know, we have more than just the land use boards here. Um, you know, are, are there things that we're looking for that uh, might be something to to talk about? Uh, Ann Proto, I'm the Recreation Director in Norfolk. So uh, the Recreation Commission uh, has recently done a master plan. We're about 95% complete. Um, and we have identified that uh, based on what fields we have and the current use, we are short five to six fields, uh, athletic fields in Norfolk. And uh, we have looked in a lot of places and find, trying to find dry, developable, land in Norfolk is not an easy thing to do. So we are very, we would be very interested in, you know, cut, you know, a, a development that would enable us to have access to fields um, and, or a layout of fields. And we have looked at expanding Pond Street for about five acres, but that's, you know, gives us two fields tops. Uh, at Freeman Kennedy, we have definitely have fields, but their their layout it has there's some safety concerns, <coughs> ADA accessibility concerns that don't are not not addressed. And in order to address those, we would lose more fields. We lost fields when the Freeman Kennedy School was the new school was built. Um, where you know more and more people are using our fields, and we have less and less space. So we would very much be interested in an area that has potential for recreation fields. I know uh, when you spoke, talked about the 40R, uh, you know, there's always the component of being close to transportation, et cetera. I mean, we, you know, one of the other things that we do have at our, uh, in our tools is the, just the, our relationship with GATRA. I mean, I know Millis uses GATRA to get, to make connectivity to the, to the MBTA station. You know, I'm not saying we want to do that, but that is something that uh, is done in the area. Anybody else have uh, kind of global topics that they might want to suggest? I know uh, Mr. Nic Nicodemus always has an idea or two. Uh, probably not a uh, productive idea, but my concept is that uh, <laughs> this is a very complex product proposal development concept that's been submitted and really it's fresh out of the bag. Uh, I think there's probably going to be a benefit if the uh, uh, town can see that to uh, allowing boards and commissions to have a chance to think this one through now that we've seen this, potentially to have these plans available at town hall and to potentially set up another meeting for discussion because I think throwing darts on the wall uh, for what, if, when, and how uh, is probably not the best way to get to a resolution that would be productive. One of the things that, that Tom had suggested that I thought was a great idea was putting together a working group. And if we can get, you know, members of uh, different boards, uh, you know, recreation, uh, affordable housing, uh, maybe neighborhood uh, representatives, um, and, uh, you know, if you could contact me maybe at the end of the night tonight and let me know if you're interested in participating in that, that would be, uh, I think, a great way. And then maybe that group has some kind of detailed conversations, goes back to your individual boards, has conversation, and then, and then if it makes sense that we bring, have another roundtable at some time in the future. Um, and Patrick Tulio on the Con uh, Conservation Commission. <laughs> Does, I mean, with all the great suggestions on... Uh, on recreation stuff like that, but what uh, what Bob was saying with the water concerns until that is resolved, I don't even see any reason to bring up any other any other ideas. I I, I would have to see if there's a plan of action for the water uh, problem that could arise with a large development or of any sort like that until a, some kind of plan is sketched out with a possible outcome. I really don't see going down the road and see what the uh, what the site could be used for. I mean, unless it's going to be total open space with no development on it whatsoever, or very little development where the current water supply and road width can handle. Until the plan of that kind of infrastructure improvement is actually sketched out and then presented to us, then maybe we can go on and talk about a recreation field and, you know, additional things of that nature. Well, I think that the, certainly the water supply issue is, uh, is, is critical. Um, you know, I don't know necessarily that it's... Uh, 
uh, this developer's burden. So it's something that you know he wants to partner with us. That's that's great. Um, you know, but at the end of the day, if he wants to go forward with his application as you know a, a, a traditional uh, concept, then we'll have to work on that. And, and you know, through the permitting process, we'll have to decide whether or not we have the infrastructure. Um, I, you know, I guess I, I'm, I'm more of let's work in in uh, parallel tracks and try and work on that as one of the issues. But I don't want to give up on trying to resolve some other issues as well. Mr. Bullock, back in the cheap seats. Uh, just curious on the uh, what your time frame is on for the development. Question was what, what the time frame was for the development, and <clears throat> another question would be on top of that would be: Are you looking for zoning changes, uh, or a, a, like a whole new zoning district, or anything like that? Or are those just the things that you're tossing around for the whole development? Um. Right now, any potential zoning changes or anything like that, that would have to come out of some type of working group, um, you know, with everybody's thoughts coming together here with that. Um, time frame, if everyone here um, decides that we should be working together in some type of roundtable session with that, um, you know, I would hope that the people here and everything go back to their boards and you can talk with your boards, maybe come up with concerns and... Um, things and, and bring that to a working group session and I, I would hope that you know within two to three weeks we, we might be able to um, have those concerns at least given to us and then set up another working table session to see at least where we're going with things um, ideally a project of, of this size and everything that um, you know has so many different opportunities with it it's it, it takes years it's not something that happens in six months or one year or even sometimes two years it takes a couple of years <coughs> to do these things or, or longer sometimes um, you know to flush out things and make it happen um, that's you know my perception with things this isn't something I want to rush by any means but it's something that I do want to have continuous progress with so. One thing I would add to that is, uh, in a sense, what we're doing tonight is kind of like a scoping meeting. Um, and I'd said, uh, you know, getting the issues on the table is, is hugely important. That adds real value to, to us as well, uh, because that helps make decisions about where to put resources. So I think uh, getting the questions answered, and obviously tonight is, is you know, preliminary, and, and there's a lot more detail, and there's a lot of institution, institutional knowledge that we don't yet uh, necessarily have all of that. but but framing those questions so that then you basically have a punch list. And as you go forward, you're, there's always maybe something new, but to get those, the biggest issues on the table uh, so that decisions can be made about how to get, uh, get the answers. And then as you go forward, ideally where it goes well, uh, there's, you know, that gets to be a shorter and shorter list. And typically always at the end of the day, there's some, you know, the, the most difficult issues, but the really fundamental ones like water supply, uh, there's no question that's part of the critical path that's got to be, uh, you know, there's got to be at least a, a conceptually feasible idea, you know, to justify making the investments to, to work that through to a more specific proposal. Yeah. Hi, I'm Walter Byron, Planning Board. <clears throat> I'm just wondering why you uh, chose to think about conventional housing here as opposed to sort of a replication of uh, the village at River's Edge. <coughs> um, perhaps it's economics. Uh, I'm really not sure, but uh, just that's the question. Um, the, the real um, straightforward answer with that is that's not zoned in here. Over where we did the village at River's Edge, that's a, that's a um, zoning district that allows age-restricted <coughs> housing. This zoning district here is just residential development, so it's not a permitted or by right use. However, if we were going to go with some type of, um, you know, incentive-based zoning type of thing, we could introduce ranches and other things like that that would um, be attractive to over 55 and people that um, are looking to downsize. So that's something to consider as well. We've had very good success with that neighborhood, and um, you know, yeah. and um, did you have? And actually, um, ranches and, and those types of. Uh, Housing, I think, is something that's truly needed. So that would be something that we would definitely entertain in this neighborhood. On the on the water issue, Tom, um, it, it isn't your issue. It's our issue, and it's it's real. It's here today. Um, 
we, we have 139 unfinished lots that are already approved in town. You have 844 homes that have the ability to connect that have not connected. And we have anywhere from a low of 250 to a high of 800 potential units that are either potentially before the board or could be before the board in a very short period of time. So the issue is real. And, and we've known about it for several years, and we've been exploring it and looking at different opportunities. So, um, and it's an expensive adventure. Um, so anything we can do to, to partner to, with, to help us bring this to some solutions, because we have to find a solution. It's not an option for us. So um, that, that certainly is a positive. We're, we're not a permitting board, but the water we own one way or the other. Um, and uh, we, we have to deal with this. We have no choice because we, we're exposed even with what's proposed currently without your project. So we have an issue. If I can, one other thing I'd like to mention, I almost I should apologize to uh, Recreation Director, and respectfully, I disagree with um, with the thought that we shouldn't talk about ball fields right now because well, the does no, I understand. I j just something I thought when you were talking that I that should have come out is um, this is exactly the time to be brainstorming these types of ideas because uh, I know I have two children in the town speaking as a resident of this town, and. Uh, you can't find ball fields to play in right now. We are in great need of it. You can't find basketball courts. We're in great need of that kind of space. But um, so that's a, to me, that's a factor that the town should consider. It also lends value to this town to have those types of uh, recreation. Um, yeah. If this turns out, and if that report can be read and understood, you'll find that uh, we do have a serious need for water. You pointed that out, and you, made, you took some time with it. If this is the site, permitting is a, is a real problem. That site could have enough water to supply three towns, and it doesn't, matter, doesn't mean that we're going to get permitted. So I think that um, we should be grateful that you're here. If nothing happens here, that at least you're giving us an opportunity to, uh, to exploit water and uh, recreation and helicopter pad, anything. It's, it's whatever, you know, it's a, it's a time to, to get out some ideas, and uh, I, I think it's a, it's a great meaning to have that. Anything should come out. Tom, when you come back, can you take the, uh, the map with all the delineations on it that we all agreed upon and place these plans on those maps? We can do that. It's, it's hard to see if Ian Proto is going to have area for ball field if the ball fields are on wetlands or have to cross the stream or something. So it really, the same deal as over the airport. Unless we know where the resources are, we don't know where to stay away and what can be done where. So if you were to put your concept plan, put the conventional subdivision plan on the map uh, that have everything delineated, then that's, that's a good start. We can do that. That's not a problem. Anything else that anybody wanted to accomplish, Tom, or anybody else? I, I guess, based on the discussions we have here tonight, um, is it possible just to maybe just get a, a straw vote or a, a hand raise? I mean, are we heading down the right path with maybe some, some working type of um, group, a smaller group with, a, with um, to flesh out different ideas and to see which way is potentially the best way to develop this. Is it, is it possible to maybe just get a show of hands? Um, you know, who's in favor of that? Yes, if, if you're in favor of um, some type of, um, you a know. Working group? Um, I'm sorry? A small working group? Is that a, a smaller working group, maybe with a representative from the appropriate boards. And um, you know, could, I, could I say that that's most of the people here? Why, why not? <laughs> no? All right. no, I appreciate that. I mean, I, it just gives us a direction that we're heading down the right, the right path with that. Um, is it, um, I know that everybody here is going, to go, is going to go back to their boards and have some discussions with that and maybe flush out different things, that, you know, topics we haven't even talked about. Um, I, I don't have, a, a, you know, any, any problem or anything if we can prepare like a plan or something that... Um, that shows the, the wetland delineations that we agreed upon through our uh, filing and maybe distribute that out um, to the different boards and organizations. The only problem is, is this is such a huge site, it's hard to read. There was 
there was about 11 miles of wetlands, I think, or something like that, delineation with the river bank going through here. There is some vast areas of uplands, though. Um, so I, I don't know the best way to distribute something that's, that people can read. Just use a couple of colors and put a couple of shades in, one for the 0 to 50, one for the, the 50 to 100, and maybe the riverfront district, just to get a head start, <coughs> you know, basically. Yeah, just, just something that could give an overall. It's no, it's no different than what you did when you started this. You came to us first, you delineate, because before you delineate, you don't know what you're doing. So the same start that you did, that's what the town should have, too. We're starting on the same path. Mm -hmm. I, I, I understand and everything. When we came to you, though, we actually had, I think we had plans that were, like, bigger than this on that. Is that the type of plan that we should leave in town hall, or should maybe we do something like a 24 by 36 and, and maybe distribute something out? We should bring a big plan like that and bring it to the working committee as a start. Okay. You wouldn't, nobody would like to see something before then? Heads up to whoever runs this thing. Obviously, I'm in town hall, so I'm okay with the big one. But, uh, Me too. Yeah, you can come to town hall and see it. Okay. Go ahead, Walter. Yeah, uh, Tom, a follow-up question <clears throat> to that uh, age-restricted housing issue. If uh, I recognize the issue of, of not uh, being allowed in the current zoning, <coughs> but if uh, zoning were to be changed to allow that through one method or another, would that be your preferred approach to building these units, or would you still prefer to build conventional, whether it be cluster or regular? Mm -hmm. I think that I, I'd like to mix different types of, of residential development. I think some type of um, um, uh, set aside for, for ranches or, or age restricted, um, maybe some smaller homes, um, three bedroom homes, things like that, that uh, you know, could be starter homes. Um, a little bit different. Um, mm -hmm. It's a little bit different economics out there today and things. And I think we can, you know, we can actually mix up the neighborhood very, very nicely in, in different areas and, and um, <coughs> come up and, and attract different types of uh, demographics to the, to the project that would not impact the town, you know, as significant as four or five bedroom houses would. Yeah. yeah. If I can get a, some type of plan here next week um, to the town hall, or maybe a, something this size that shows some delineations on it for people's review. What would be um, a time frame to, to maybe have some feedback from everybody here from the boards and commissions back to us and maybe setting another time for a, um, a working group session? After? So the working group next week and then round table week after? Yeah. So how about a work, if we try and do a working group session next Thursday and then a round table the week after that? Call a special meeting and get going. You, your meet, you're posted tonight. <laughs> well, I don't know. Do you think, John, that the boards have to? I mean, you you certainly know in terms of you're not ruling on anything at this point in time, so that you don't have to go before a board and, and get a, a vote on anything. Uh, I know it's informational, but. So what time frame would that be? I'm not sure. Yeah, well, we meet the two weeks, the 12th. Yeah, we meet the 12th. You meet the 12th? <coughs> yeah. So the week after would work? Rob would, sure. What, what, it, what would work well is if um, I could get comments back before a working group meeting or something, just so I have time to digest them and I can bring back some, you know, some, some good answers and some, you know, and some things that may... Um, you know, it just gives us some, some food for thought before we sit down with everything. So if I could have maybe some comments a week so before so that um, engineers and, and, and planners and things could look at stuff. Um, and the 13th is a Thursday, John, after your meeting on the 12th. Could we do that? <laughs> I think so. I, I won't be able to be there, but hmm. someone else might be able to Michelle? Microphone for oh. <laughs> Michelle Mayhew, Planning Board. Can I just ask that maybe we slow things down a little bit? I think, you know, Tom understands that this is a journey and uh, not a sprint. And I think giving some thoughtfulness to how we want to structure a working group, how we want to structure a roundtable, um, you know, do we want to 
pick a person from each board to join rather than, you know, two, three, four people. I think giving a little bit of thought of strategy and giving the board some time is, is probably the more mindful thing to do given the, the size and scale. I think we keep things moving. We certainly set target dates. I'm not looking to, you know, prolong it any longer than necessary. But I do think we should be thoughtful and not be put on the spot to say by next week everyone should have their comments in. My two cents. Committee. In, in the meantime, the working committee could get together, and and uh, I understand Tom's uh, <laughs> need to move it along. But you know, in all honesty, as, as Michelle said, this is going to be a long, drawn-out process, and uh, there's no two ways about it. And if you uh, start quickly in the middle, you're going to hurt yourself potentially, and maybe a benefit for the town. So, I think it should be done right. But if we had a working committee and spend time on focusing that. I mean, I can think of a, a, a bunch of things that we could send to Tom before our first meeting that he could prepare data on. You know, one, of the, one of the things, we have no numbers for the, for the number of homes in a, on the conventional subdivision. If you had a number of homes in that conventional subdivision, we say 150 here, you can work up some, up some uh, this, this is a, an effect on the tax base, obviously. So if you worked out some financial dynamics on the potential revenue, the selling price of the conventional subdivision, the selling price on the smaller homes, the effect the number of bedrooms, how many kids in the community, there's going to be a substantial uh, uh, difference in total revenue for the town. And as you know, the, the, the lower revenue we get from each home, the more the tax rate goes up. So I think the town is going to be looking at the financial dynamics of which they would rather have. Well, they'd rather have houses that sell for seven and eight, bringing in $12,000 in tax revenue, or houses that sell for three <coughs> that bring in five and start to weigh the difference in bedrooms, et cetera. So I think that if we put together a lot of that information, Jim, a working committee, and then passed it on to save time, you could prepare some of this information in the meantime just to move things. And I don't think, I don't think the questions initially would have been <coughs> board discussions of that. Some, some of you may not know that there's that we have done this before. It, it's been a long time, Michelle, but, but we did we had established a roundtable process. I think the last one we did, honestly, was 2007, 2008, uh, dated as it be. But uh, it basically, it was one member from each board picked by the board uh, to represent that group. And we had that was the working group, per se. And that, in fact, was really the roundtable discussion. We had more general meetings, but that really was the roundtable working group. So there is a precedent for it, and we did have a policy in place for it. Just hasn't used it very much, unfortunately, which is unfortunate. We should have. Yeah. With with the comments that I'm hearing, I, I do agree. This 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 isn't a sprint. This is sort of a <coughs> type of thing. And um, actually, March 13th, I, I know that um, Angus couldn't make that meeting. And, and to tell you the truth, um, <coughs> that's only less than two weeks away. I don't know how much information I could get that would be, you know, really usable and 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 good information that quick back after receiving questions and things too. I'm thinking it, it, it would probably take at least a, a board meeting or so for to flesh out questions that different boards would have, get it to us, and it would probably take at least a week or so for us to go through um, and try to answer some of those questions before you know um, something could happen. I mean, if we wanted to set a target date, maybe something towards the end of March or something like that would, would be, I think, you know, would be realistic for us. I'm not speaking for everyone here. A that, April gets really tough for us because that, okay. that's, uh, that's the crunch month before town meeting. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're kind of booked up with advisory board and budgets and all of at least for our board. We're, that's a tough month. Okay. So, so the end of March would be fine. Yeah, it sounds like that, that would be a good, good timeline to give. Uh, and, and what I was going to suggest is that if, uh, if this will appear on, on agendas, whether that's planning or, or uh, conscom or, or selectmen or what have you, uh, we're happy to put together a, an informational packet with uh, kind of really what's been presented. Uh, tonight, you know what what we feel the opportunity is, and that way for those members who weren't here, uh, that'll help to frame the discussions. What do you think, mm -hmm. Scott? I think, yeah. I mean, I, um, I think you know, it, it, I felt a little rushed, but I mean, the end of March, you know, I mean, I think Tommy felt a little rushed too. I mean, there's a lot of questions out there, but I, I do too want to keep it moving. But I think we can do that. Okay. You know, there's all this new information. I'm, I'm assuming you didn't understand or realize about the the water line mm -hmm. being run. Mm -hmm. No, we, I, that's no I mean, that, I mean, that's a significant number. I, I know well, that because I have the numbers from the last people. And, I mean, all these things you've got to start Don't to put you together yourself, that. too, and, you know, come up with a better idea of the direction you want to go in, too. Mm -hmm. 
And that's something, if, if that's still a requirement to run the water main to the Franklin Town Main. <coughs> you know, I, I don't even know if that is at this point in time, or if that was just a, a condition of that subdivision because of water. You know. Condition of both subdivisions, yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, John. It was a condition of both subdivisions because the water has to have a loop. Would March 27th work? That's Thursday. John, I mean, board, board members, would that work March 27th? Thursday. For a round table. For a round table? Mm -hmm. No. I mean, a working group. Sorry, working group. So could the boards pick your representatives and we'll meet on the 27th? Good for you, Tom. Does that work with, with our team and things, Rick, Tom, John? Mm -hmm. That seems to work. Mm -hmm. In case anybody hasn't heard, we did hire a planner. Uh, we're hoping to hear back from him on Monday if he accepts our offer. So uh, he'll certainly be part of this team as quickly as possible. When would he start? Uh, four to five weeks from now. <coughs> Comes with a lot of, he's a, he is a planner right now down in Rhode Island. Uh, got a lot of. Thanks, Tom. Very applicable experience in a very uh, town about the same size. So. As we wrap things up tonight, I just wanted to thank everybody for coming out here for, for this night tonight. I mean, this probably isn't where everybody wants to be, but um, I think it's really beneficial to the town and, and how we, we work together here with things. So thank you very much, and I look forward to working with everybody. Yeah. There's no, I mean, it's not for, you know, not for I, mean, I, don't, I don't know if she's still on TV, but, you know.